I want to deconstruct one of the worst communication disasters in sports and nonprofit history. It's attached to the name of Lance Armstrong, the greatest winner in cycling history, and also a man who undid the validity of cyclists all over the world and challenged the ethics of the sport. Now, there's an underlying subject matter here that I want to talk about, and that is emotional intelligence. EI is so important. The intelligent quotient is often measured, and the IQ is valuable as an index and a metric, but emotional intelligence is important. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two episodes and one, we're going to look at the events that brought Lance Armstrong to the forefront of the greatest scandal in cycling history. In the second part of this, we're going to talk about on how Lance Armstrong took this scenario, this situation, and how he made it worse. And what we're going to do is study some communication skills and look at the value of humility and the value of being empathetic, especially when one has their own uh, guilt ratio in in the event. So um, oftentimes in documentaries or in books, um, you, you could, you could simply take David Walsh's book, which, which David Walsh was the reporter that really brought, uh, Lance Armstrong down. And it's called the seven deadly sins, my pursuit of Lance Armstrong. And so David Walsh becomes the arch enemy of of Lance Armstrong and the the industry's um, minds that are complicit. But if you want to know how Lance Armstrong was brought down, you need to look at Lance Armstrong, not David Walsh. So there's two people that stand out in this story that are that are the truth tellers. One is a, a, a lady named Emma O'Reilly. And the other one is David Walsh. Emma O'Reilly was was a uh, masseuse on the U.S. Postal Team's uh, cycling team, and and then David Walsh was the reporter that that just persistently would not let the story go. Now he was demonized, and and at one point uh, they said that he was the white knight against the great demon Lance Armstrong. So. Um, and it was all conspiracies and it was all, you know, just outlandish lies until even now there is a report out that came out in 2015 and a cycling professional felt that even today, 90% of the Peloton was doping. Although he thought there was little orchestrated team doping in the manner that teams had previously in the Armstrong days employed. Another put it at around 20%. Many people simply stated they didn't know who was clean and who was not. A lot of these discrepancies may be caused by the definition of doping used by the individuals. And so we're going to cover just a little bit of, uh, of that so that you can understand what it is. First of all, let me uh, start by saying that the Tour de France is the most harsh and violent against the human body of any sport there was, okay? And, and so when you think about this, let's, let's talk about the Tour de France just a little bit. Uh, the sport is so destructive to the body 
And this is a quote, the tour de force is the most unhealthy thing on the face of the earth. Quote, when those guys finish the, do- the tour de France, they are osteopenic loss of bone mass as, as you lose calcium. So literally, they're not losing weight. These dudes are, are cycling through the Tour de France, and we're going to show you a, a map all the way uh, of the Tour de France. It is a, a brutal run, okay? And so you, you think about this. Their bone mass is eroding during this race. And it, how, how long is the race? How big is the race? Let's talk about it, okay? It lasts for 24 days, okay? It's 3,350 kilometers or 2,081 miles. The average cyclist burns 8,000 calories a day during this 24-day period, okay? Um, at the end of it, they all are suffering um, the loss of uh, of dense bone mass, okay? So one, one sports writer wrote, if we think that watching these guys kill themselves, riding six hours a day, hitting peak thresholds of six watts per kilogram, if we think there is anything physiologically reasonable about this, we are crazy. Okay, so I, I just want you to understand that nothing that I'm saying, nothing that I'm talking about is, is to diminish the sheer output. And, and let me say this, that Lance Armstrong, while he did break rules, um, there, the Cycling Independent Report Commission in 2015 said 20 to 90 percent of the peloton is guaranteed to be doping in 2015. Now, to the average cyclist and the average guy or gal that's just out there riding, this type of of doping is not going to make a substantive difference on you. But as you're burning through 8,000 calories a day and your blood is not able to replenish its cell count, if you could have a store of your pre-race blood stored up. So what they would do, and and I'll get into this in a little bit, what they would do is they would take of their own blood, not somebody else's, not drugged up, you know, this, that, and the other thing, blood that had high cell counts, had high proteins, and and all of the numbers were were great pre-race on it. And imagine if as your blood begins to um, uh, wear out and, and it's not able to replenish itself with the blood cells that it needs and, and, and you're losing bone density at this point, imagine if, if you could transfuse your own pre-race blood back into your system. So what these guys in, were doing was they were keeping massive stores of their own pre-race blood and then in the middle of the race, they would get a blood transfusion. And this is considered uh, doping. Okay, so um, that, that's basically the lay of the land uh, very, very quickly. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's genetically modified, you know, human constructs. And we can get into this and we could even look at Michael Phelps, right? Michael Phelps could be efficient at shuttling uh, lactate acid out of the cell to liver that turns lactate back into glucose. Okay. So, I mean, Phelps was like on another level and he wins world records with a lactate level of like eight point something percent or 8.0 percent. And, and that's like unheard of because the, the the lactate levels get lower and lower and, and then they are not able to you know, uh, create the, the need of the glucose, the glucose to, to make the energy anyhow. Um, and, and you get into measuring that by like VO two max and stuff. And so Lance Armstrong is getting blood transfusions. Okay. And, and he, he has this guy and, and so is a race buddy on the U S postal team. 
and his name is Floyd Landis, and we'll we'll get to him in, in, in another piece, okay? Now, Floyd outed everyone on the U.S. Postal Team. He wrote all about it and the internal life, what the internal life was like and all of this stuff, okay? But Armstrong, he was a smart man, okay? But it was more of the analytical type. I don't think he was emotionally intelligent. When you, when you watch Lance Armstrong, you, you get a sense that this guy is, is brilliant. <coughs> this guy is very, very smart. And he's, he's nobody's dummy. He's well-spoken. He's, he's at the height of his game. And, and also, he is a major, because his name becomes branded, right? And, and he, he has Armstrong Live Strong, the Cancer Foundation, because he had prostate cancer and had overcome that. So he has this massive nonprofit, okay, that's worth, like, it's, it's bringing in, like, $500 million at one point, okay? So while he's very smart, he's not very emotionally intelligent. He failed to realize that Floyd Landis would constitute a very dangerous enemy. So Armstrong gets out, and, and this is the crazy part. Had Lance not come back, he would have never been caught. All of his records, all of his wins would have been there, and, and, and that's just all there is to it, okay? So, um, but when Floyd gets caught, Floyd gets caught doping. He reaches out to, to Lance and he's like, hey, dude, um, can you help me kind of get my life back together? And Lance Armstrong dismisses him as like, no, you're a loser. You got caught. Well, it so brutally savages his ex-teammate Floyd Landis um, that Floyd Landis got in trouble after a 2006 Tour de France and came back and he reached out to, to Lance for some help. And uh, this isn't a direct quote, quote, but Lance was basically like, get lost, you're a loser. Okay, so uh, uh, here, here's another, let's just jump over. Another mind-blowing fact is what he did to Emma O'Reilly. So he knows that Floyd Landis knows he doped. He also knows that Emma O'Reilly... Um, knows exactly what he's done, okay? And everything he has gotten in terms of his doping consequences, he deserves because he how he handles Emma O'Reilly, okay? He just, the minute she tries to correct or tries to say, hey, guys, we should probably look into this whole doping thing, Lance Armstrong just opens up both barrels on her and basically just destroys her. Okay, so think about the Discovery press conference in 2004. It says what, what he did uh, to Emma O'Reilly was despicable. And he basically destroys this woman's life. And, and she wasn't naming names. She wasn't, all he was doing was just obliterating her, right? And, and bullying them. So Landis stayed in Lance's apartment. Here's how you got to understand what happened. So Floyd Landis gets caught and he's like, Lance, could you like tell him that kind of everybody is, is doing a little bit of this? And Lance Armstrong just like, get, get lost, loser. Well, the problem is, is that Floyd Landis was his cycling partner and Landis had stayed in Lance's apartment to watch his blood. So Lance goes out, he's got to go do something, and he's got this freezer. Now, if I remember right, the, the way it works is you got to keep your blood at like two, three degrees Celsius, right? Right above freezing. And so Lance has to go on this big advertising tour, and he's going to speak worldwide. I mean, he is the, you know, the, the star of the show. <coughs> and so he, he goes to... Floyd Landis, and he's, look, he says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to stay in my apartment, you know, you guys, because 
Lance Armstrong's rich, right? He had a nice apartment. Uh, at the time, Floyd was like a back peddler. He's not, you know, anywhere on the on the level that Lance Armstrong is. So, you know, he, he either can live in the in the dormitory or on the bus traveling around, or he can go stay in a really nicely appointed um, apartment that was paid for by uh, sponsorship. So he's like, yeah, man, free apartment for a month, month and a half. Well, what's the catch? Well, here's the deal. I got this fridge down there, freezer, and it, it's full of blood. And so I want you to monitor it and make sure because it's very valuable. It's all my blood. Well, this is called blood doping, right? Because you take this fresh blood that's not depleted during uh, the low cell counts and it's not producing uh, enough of these, you know, uh, lactates to turn back into glucose and you, you put it back in. It's fresh blood. So Landis knows this. So Lance Armstrong his arrogance gets in his way. And he's so he gets up at a press conference and he unloads both barrels on Floyd Landis, who stayed in his apartment. Okay. So at the and this is at the Discovery press conference. Now, that's 2004. Okay. So Landis does this and he watched so that nothing, you know, would go wrong. And when he needed a bit of help, Lance Armstrong just wa wasn't going to do anything about it. He wanted nothing to do with it, okay? So let, let's get into a, a little, just a tiny little bit of the, the research around this, okay? So um, what, what you have is you have a VO2 max, which is the gold standard to measure overall fitness. Aerobic fitness is, is assessed by having the subject perform exercise at increased loads for 12 to 15 minutes while breathing into a mouthpiece which collects information on the inspired and expired air. A treadmill, personal bike on a compute trainer, or a stationary bicycle are typically used. The test starts with an easy to moderate thing and then it moves up until it's it's literally like harder than what you can imagine. If you hit peak plateau, it measures your VO2 max output. And then what happens is, is then they have you at start of race levels, okay? Your oxygen consumption and var various heart rates, speed and or power levels. Uh, so then they know what you're kind of capable and what you're not capable of. OK, so he gets in the middle of these races and there are these places where you're not you're just you've got to catch your breath. You've got to, you know, calm down. And so you get into these places where you have to stagnate the line. You cannot overtake. And furthermore, you just don't have the energy at that point. That's why the race is designed to say everybody stay in line. You're you're team's going to come near you. You're going to get a drink at the end of this. You're going to get, you know, you're going to get a little bit of, um, of food because they're eating while they're doing it. They're burning 8,000 calories a day, right? So the drug that they're using, EPO, blood doping, it, it doesn't really have any real world effect on anybody else. But on these guys, it, it very much does. Okay, so he gets in this and in the middle of this, he starts overtaking and, and at first everybody's like, he's superhuman. He's Lance Armstrong. And then somebody says, no, he's gotten an infusion because that's not physically, it's not technically allowed and it's not physically um, possible. And so at this point, you, you've got all these big names that line up on all this, right? So there's a big confrontation about it. Now, let me let me just say this, okay? So think about you or I falling off a bike. Is it is it shatter you? Like you, you fall off a bike, generally you're going to scuff your knee, you're going to, you know, skid your elbow, but you're going to kind of make it. When these guys start taking accidents, um, they're so depleted, their oxygen levels, 
and their bone density mass is so depleted that they can shatter stuff when they, when they do this, right? So it's like completely different level. So in walks um, this girl, Emma O'Reilly, and she raises up the concern and gives an insider account. And all of a sudden in the race for truth, O'Reilly was the masseuse to Armstrong and his U.S. Postal Service team at the start of his domination of the Tour de France and went on to provide evidence of his and the team's doping, although critically not the smoking gun that came later from his teammate Floyd Landis. The difference is that even when O'Reilly was within Armstrong's inner circle as a woman in a man's world who did not buy into the doping culture she was treated as an outsider okay she admits it's unbelievable what these guys are going through but she starts facing all these massive power brokers within the sport okay so on a personal level they begin to take advantage of her and they begin to just destroy her reputation okay so it's a chaotic legal fallout from the interview she gave to Walsh Walsh in 2003, which formed the central element of his and Pierre Ballester's book, L.A. Confidential, the beginning and the lengthy process ending in Armstrong's unveiling by the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. Now, the picture is one of constant legal wrangling in which she was trapped by egos on all sides, Lance, David, the lawyers, all trying to outsmart, argue against, influence, control each other, while she says, I was stuck in the middle of it. It was insane. The pressure contributes to all kinds of issues that she has. And so Armstrong decides, all, all Emma O'Reilly wants is somebody to say, yes, this is a real issue within the, the cycling industry and sport. And she said, if you guys will come out and say, yes, it is an issue, it is an issue and somewhere along the line, we're complicit in the culture that has promoted this type of rule breaking, she would have went away. Okay, that never happens. And so what you have is you have these press conferences over and over and over where these egos refuse to call the dogs off on the on the people who are crying foul, okay? So here's, here's what I want you to look at from a com- communication aspect. What could he have done with, number one, David Walsh? Um, number two, what, how could he have treated um, Emma O'Reilly differently? Or how could he have been more empathetic knowing that he too was guilty of the same thing Floyd Landis was. If he would have shown empathy to Floyd Landis, how could he have got Floyd to recognize, okay? And so you have this basically egotistical man that refuses. Now, guys, I'm I'm not diminishing the power of this man. I'm not diminishing his ability, his agility. I'm not diminishing any of it. I'm just telling you, he handled this in the worst way possible because instead of going, okay, so think about if you needed a biblical reference to Lance Armstrong, it would be King David, right? Nathan, the prophet comes to him and says, listen, you know, cause David had taken another man's wife and killed the man, right? And so the prophet comes to David and says, listen, there was a rich man that had everything in the world. And then there was a poor man next to him who only had one sheep. And, and the rich man that had all the sheep in the world took the one poor man's single sheep. What should you do to him? And David jumps up and says, kill him. And, and Nathan the prophet said, thou art the man. And there's this moment where he's just spiritually and emotionally and psychologically body checked. And David says, oh, man, have mercy on me. You know, so he changes instantly from kill him to have mercy on him. So when you look at this situation and you and you analyze this, 
what he could have done with Floyd Landis was to embrace him as a broken friend and say, listen, I'm just as guilty as you are. Don't destroy me with you. Um, but I do understand your plight and I'm, I want to work out a plan where I can help you to race again or help you to, you know, get, get your life back together and regain and recoup some of your reputational status. And, and here's, here's men that are osteopenic at the end of this race. And, and he's like, you know, Landis is, is arguing the point that, um, that they're so osteopenic that they have to have something right. And, and so, you know, it, it's staggering what these guys are going through, but he doesn't do that. He throws his friend to the side of the road and says, I want nothing from you. I want nothing out of you. You're a loser. You got caught. Don't even talk to me. Well, guess who Floyd goes and talks to? He goes and talks to the press. He goes and talks to the anti-doping agency. He goes and talks to David Walsh. And Lance Armstrong is the cause of pushing this man away. So showing empathy. And this is where um, Lance Armstrong is a living embodiment. This story is a living uh, example of Jesus' teaching Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The reason Lance Armstrong got no mercy from anyone involved is because he how he handled this situation, because how he handled those that were around him. So you're going to see a few things in this, and this podcast is different, and I, I highly recommend you to watch this because there's parts of this that's only going to make sense, and when you see it, it becomes even a more amazing story. Uh, you'll see um, a couple things about Emma O'Reilly. You'll see um, one or two things about Floyd Landis. But it's important that you understand how he, through his lack of empathy, lack of compassion and mercy, and his lack of emotional intelligence, he made the situation worse than it had to be. So think about this. Think about our own lives. What have we done in our lives that when it came to judging others or when it came to needing something, did we make it worse? And that's the real question at the core of this subject matter is how do we make things worse? I, I deal with situations all the time and I think, man, if they just would have let it alone, it wouldn't be this bad off. But they didn't and they wouldn't. And because they didn't and because they would not, the situation progressively became worse and worse. So we don't want to be them people. We don't want to be the people that go through trials or trouble or some type of calamity in our life and make it worse. We don't want it to be worse. We, we want to make things better. We want to communicate in ways where there's healing and there's restoration and there's a redemptive lift applied to those that are in need. And we don't want to ostracize people and you never, never kick a man when he's down. And Lance Armstrong kicked Floyd Landis when he was down. And in the next episode, you're going to see how ugly and how bad it can get when you mistreat somebody who's on the ropes. 